Um, welcome to our Stomp Out Stigma SOS Forum. We are so excited to have you here, if not in person, by live streaming. And we're excited to announce that we will be recording all of this and we'll rebroadcast it and stream it out again, um, along with Live Live, which is tonight at 7 o'clock. We're doing a worldwide streaming. And I've been working with Brenda, uh, Brandy Vega from that, and we're excited to be a part of that as well. So um, we will get those both of those together because we want you to hear this message. So if you aren't able to hear it tonight, you will hear it one way or another. I want to welcome our special guests. Um, they took time out of their very, very busy schedules to come, and we're so pleased to have them. Um, we have Miss Utah, our new Miss Utah, uh, Lindsay Larson here. We're so excited to have her. Um, she is studying um, talent or ballet performance. I can't, goodness, I can't say that. <laughs> Can I see y'all again? No, thank you. It has been the longest day of my life right now, so please be patient. The University of Utah is, is, a, is an aspiring professional ballerina, artistic director, and health educator. Uh, her social impact initiative is the movement movement, which is appropriate for our event, and focusing on physical activity for better mental health. So it fits in just great. So we're so glad to have Lindsay Larson with this. And then we also have Mrs. Utah America, Jessica Whalen. Um, she is amazing as well. She was a former pro dancer for the Radio Disney and the NFL's Open Raiders, right? Raiderettes, is that right, Raiderettes? Yeah. And she does a lot of still things in the dance world, um, which is amazing. Her goal is to own and operate a dance studio at reduced rates, is that right? and to allow everyone to have that opportunity, which is so great because that's right in line with what Dance for Life is doing as well. Um, her mission is to educate, uh, educate individuals as they move from impoverished to improved, which is a great initiative, and has worked with the Salvation Army and Community Action Services and United Way um, to create permanent change for 38 million individuals in America living in poverty. So that's really incredible, and we're so impressed. And then we have our keynote speaker, wonderful Bob Cattell. Um, we're so excited to have him. He has been everywhere for the past three decades, um, speaking at so many events. He is a motivational speaker and has spoken at many universities and businesses throughout the United States and throughout the world. And so it is such a pleasure to have him here, and we're so um, please that you would take time out to visit us in the Capitol Theater on this wonderful World Suicide Prevention Day. Um, and so with that, we will go ahead and hear first from uh, Miss Utah Lindsay Larson, followed by our Mrs. Utah America Jessica Whalen, and then turn the rest of the time over to Bob. Thank you so much. Hello all, I'm so, so honored to be here talking about a subject that is extremely, extremely important to me. Um, so I'm Lindsay, I'm Miss Utah, I was crowned in June, uh, June 11th, here at Capitol Theater, so it's really neat to be back here, very special. Um, I, like she said, I'm a dancer at the University of Utah. Um, I got a lot of my training at Ballet West Academy, they have another location in Lehigh. And so that's where I got most of my training, and I'm very grateful for Ballet West, and all that dance has taught me, it has brought me a lot of opportunities, and I truly believe that it has shaped me to be the person that, that I am today. Um, my social impact initiative is the movement movement, which is, like she said, very, very fitting for this. Um, something that I recently found out, um, there was a study done in 2021, so after the COVID-19 pandemic, and it stated that 35% of students in Utah were feeling sad or hopeless. And that is a heartbreaking statistic. And oh, I'm getting very emotional already. <laughs> this is early. <laughs> and that's a very heartbreaking statistic to hear um, that so many students are struggling. And I feel that part of that has been um, feeling isolated and being isolated due to the COVID 19 pandemic. And so my whole initiative has been to help students uh, find an outlet through movement or physical activity like dance. 
and um, I've been able to go into elementary schools and I teach, I call them brain break activities, which are little movement based activities, and I have seen a lot of positive responses from that. It's been really neat to see these students um, find a passion for moving and find a passion for dancing. It's funny because I'll go into these classes and the boys will be like, oh, we're doing a dance, <laughs> and they are the ones dancing the biggest out of everybody, which is really cool to see. <laughs> it's very, very neat. Um, but I am so extremely grateful for dance and the opportunity that it's given me to have a creative outlet and to be able to express myself. Um, I've gone through different challenges in my life and just being able to go into the studio, turn on music, and just dance out any emotion that I'm feeling that day is something that I'm really grateful for. Um, I want to touch on a couple different uh, mental health related topics that have come up because of dance. I think dance has brought me a lot of wonderful things and opportunities, but it also has brought a couple negative things that I've seen play out in my life. Um, perfectionism is a big one, and it's a really prevalent one in the ballet world. Um, we often think that we, as dancers, and just as people, have to push ourselves beyond what is good for our well-being, and that's, that's something that's not true, and I think we need to take care of ourselves. I think dancers do a really good job of taking care of our physical being. You know, if we're injured, we get hurt, we immediately stop. I mean, not always. Sometimes we push ourselves further than we should physically, <laughs> but oftentimes we know, okay, I want to stop. I need to take care of my body, and I think that when it comes to a dancer's mental health, when we're dealing with something that we're struggling with mentally, we don't like, take that time because the show must go on. We need to continue to push ourselves. We need to do the best we can. And so it's been really important for me to step back and realize that it's okay to not be perfect. It's okay to pause. It's okay to take care of myself. If I'm having a struggle, a, a struggle day, that it's okay to take that mental health day. Something that I really appreciated is the University of Utah, we have mental health days in the dance department. And that has been something that has really benefited me. Um, so I don't have the show must go on. I have that time to take care of myself. And so I think taking those self-care days is really, really important. Um, and just learning that it's okay to make mistakes. I think as dancers and as people, we think that we have to be perfect and we have to not mess up. And we won't ever become professional dancers. We won't be able to become what we want to achieve if we make mistakes. And I've learned that it's okay. Mistakes make us stronger. Mistakes make us better. And so that's something that I'm really grateful I've been able to learn. And also as a Utah. I feel like I've learned that as well as being with Utah. It's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to mess up during a speech. <laughs> then it'll make you stronger the next time. Um, another huge one that I deal with is body dysmorphia. And I feel like that's really, really prevalent in the ballet world just because you hear a lot of companies wanting a specific body type. And that's been really hard for me, um, just not having the ideal body shape that you hear about when you think of a ballet dancer um, has been really hard on my mental health. Uh, there, I, something that I'm really grateful for that I've learned, I have to deal with a sweaty condition called hyperhidrosis, so I sweat a lot. I have the sweatiest in ballet class, and like, I'm sure we all have to do a little bit. I probably am right now. Let's have the going on. <laughs> and I sweat a lot in ballet class, and my, my friends in my dance class, they know, you know, they, they've learned to accept it now. <laughs> it's part of who I am. But when I go to auditions or when I go to these master classes, uh, other people will see me and they'll be like, oh, this is a little sweaty, I feel a little gross. <laughs> and that's that's hard, it's an insecurity that I have. And that's really frustrating when you see other people, you know, look at you for something that you're insecure about, it makes you even more insecure. And what I've learned to accept is take that insecurity that I have and make it my superpower. Something that I've really noticed is when I am sweaty, my teachers think, oh, she's working really hard. I look like I'm the hardest worker in the room. And, and so I've, I've taken that insecurity and that thing that I think makes me look weird, and I've taken it and I've made it something that makes me look stronger and makes me look like I'm working extremely hard. And so dancers and everybody, take those things that make you, make you feel insecure about yourself and make them become your superpower. Um, I also, I do a lot of work within the special needs community. I have a Special Olympics dance class um, with Special Olympics, and that has been one of the most amazing opportunities. And I have a student who uses a wheelchair, and she has taught me so much. And she just has a passion for dance and a passion for getting to move. And, you know, she might not be able to move the same way we do, but 
she is able to move, and that's what matters. And she has taught me that no matter what I look like, I get to move, and I get to share a story, and I get to share my passion with other people, and that's what matters most. And so I'm really grateful for her, her example, and um, I'm really grateful for um, just being able to be grateful for what my body can do and not for what it looks like. Um, another thing that I have noticed that helps me is when I do start to have that negative mindset of I'm picking myself apart in the mirror for what I look like, I give myself a compliment so that I can start class with a positive mindset. And so I encourage other dancers or other people, whenever you stare at yourself in the mirror and you're starting to have those negative thoughts, give yourself a con compliment and that way you can slowly start to have that positive mindset. Um, another thing that I want to share about with mental health, um, this past year, um, a former Miss USA passed away by suicide and she was just an incredible, incredible person. And something that I think a lot of people have noticed from this is that she looked like she had the most perfect life. She was a former Miss USA. She's living in New York. She was in a TV correspondent with a big TV show, and she had the clothes, and she was had this nice apartment. And so from the outside, it looked like she was living this dream life. And I think because of social media, we have that, I, that perfection that we have to look like everything's perfect all the time, and people can be struggling on the inside. And that's really something that I've learned from that experience of just we need to check in on those people who are struggling, who are showing those signs, but we also need to check in on, on those who maybe don't look like they're struggling, who maybe look like they have their lives all put together. And so that's a big thing that I've learned, and um, I hope that each of us can check in on everyone around us. I had an experience where I, I was feeling overwhelmed, I was feeling stressed out, and one of my coworkers just came up to me and said, hey, can I give you a hug? How are you doing? And that made me feel so seen. And I think we can all be a little bit more like Sammy. Go in and check on those people that you care about and that are showing signs of struggling and weren't. Um, one last thing that I want to do, and I want to high five, air five, beautiful. <laughs> now we're going to curl our middle and ring finger, so we're making an I love you sign. I want you to turn to somebody next to you and say, I love you. self-confidence 
and with our self-esteem. We're always comparing ourselves to somebody else. How can I be better? How can I look like them? How can I do better? And for me, what I want everybody to do today is take those hard times, take those challenges, and think of them, and think, how can I then better myself? So with me, I remember my very first day of dance class because I was older. I was 15 when I first started dancing, and already then, there's a lot of prejudgment there. But the reason why I couldn't dance when I was younger is because I grew up in a single parent household, a low income single parent household. And I was not able and had the opportunity to afford dance in my life. So I watched dance on TV, I read about it in books, and I just taught myself about dance. And so when I say think about those opportunities, when I went to dance, I was thrilled. I was 15 years old, a little bit older, I was a freshman, and with that, I had to step up to a different level because of my peers around me, for the ones who were my age that had all those dance skills that I didn't have. So I had to work twice as hard in order to become the dancer that I am today. And with that, I danced at this studio, and the way that I found out about this studio of dance, I slept over at my friend's house, and she invited me to come to her dress rehearsal for her dance studio. And I went to it, and then I went to her performance the next day. It was her Christmas recital that I was able to go to, and she told me it was only $25 a month to take dance here. And I was so excited, so I got home, and I asked my mom if I could take dance classes here, and I would help pay for them. I had a job, and that so I had to help pay for things for myself when I was in high school, and I was able to work, and I had to help out my family, and my mom said that I could dance here, and I was thrilled. But I said to think back, to that first day, if you remember her first day of dance, her work, I really treasure dance in my life. And like I said, I had to work twice as hard. And that's what dance is. Dance teaches you hard work and dedication. But beyond that, when I said, now think about the bad times in dance or in work in your life. What did you learn from that? Did you have those failures to find who you are today, or did you help them make you of where you are today? And so, with me dancing at age 15, a lot of people could have said, she can never dance professionally. She's, she doesn't have the technique. She hasn't had the skills since she was a child. But I didn't let any of those naysayers tell me what I could do or could not do in my life. So as an adult, my dream always was to dance for the NFL. So I tried it out. And I tried out for my favorite team for the Raiders. And it took me an entire year. I made the goal. And I want you guys to all think about that. What is the goal that you have in your life? And what are you willing to give up to achieve that goal? So I made the goal. I'm going to become a Raider vet. And I tried that entire year. I took dance classes. Again, I went back to my childhood resources of watching on TV, going to the internet, doing everything possible. I went and auditioned to be a Raider vet. I made it past the first cuts. And then I made it to the finals. And then I'm just sitting there and waiting for them to announce the team. And if any of you can think back of the time in your life, if you have been at a dance audition or anything, you're waiting and hoping. But my number wasn't called. So I did not make the regrets my very first try. So I could let that make me or break me. And I decided I'm going to let it make me. What did I learn from those failures? How can I be better to come back the next year to be stronger and fulfill this dream that I wanted? So again, I took another year, and during this year, I spoke it out into existence. And that is something that a lot of us don't do, is that we don't have that belief in ourselves, that we don't believe that we can do something. So I challenge you all, if you have a goal or a dream, you have to speak it out and put it out there in the universe. And then you have to have a support system. And I think this is what can really help with our self-esteem and our self-confidence, is when you have people behind you, no matter what happens. I was married at this time, my husband didn't love me any less because I didn't make the team. He wasn't disappointed that I didn't make the team, and I told him, I'm going to try again. For that entire year, I tried. I went to dance classes. I lived in Utah this time, this is in California. 
and I just researched the Ray Reds. I went to other professional dance clinics around America, did everything possible. I made a friend the year before after Ray Red audition. She was an alumni cheerleader. She helped me throughout the year. I went, and again, I made it past the first one, the first cuts. I made it to the finals, and then again, just sitting there and waiting. And this time, Ernie knew what could happen because I've been in this position before. So instead of thinking about, oh, remember last year when you didn't make it, I didn't think about that. I just stayed positive. With the people that were around me, the friends that I made, because this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Hundreds of ladies came out to audition each year, and I made it this far beyond all of them. Then it came time to hit the house. The director was reading the numbers, and she said 154, and that was my number. I was like, oh my gosh, I made the very rest. Are you kidding me? And it just took me. After that year, when I tried the first time, did I make it? I went back the next time. And again, I started dancing when I was 15 years old. I was able to not only be a reader at two years, it's also a radio Disney dancer. I danced in the Vanessa Hudgens music video. I danced in High School Musical 3. I did an opening dance number for various Disney artists. And today I'm able to give back and share my talent and my gift that I had. I'm also a director of the semi pro sensational team here in the state of Utah. And it's all because I did your love. So no matter what is going on in your life, I challenge you to make a goal, set that goal, and don't give up. Because you never know what you can achieve with that. And I can relate that to me being Mrs. Utah. I didn't think I'd ever compete at Mrs. Utah, but I wanted to give back to my community and serve. And that was the reason why I competed. And when I went and competed, there were many women who had competed before. And I've never competed at Mrs. Utah. And I was able to win. And again, there's that disappointment. And after I became Mrs. Utah, I made it my goal. Of, it's not just about me, it's about everybody else. And so I sent texts to every single lady who competed. I called them and spoke to them and let them know how much I valued them, how much of an impact that they made in my life. And just because they did not walk away as Mrs. Utah doesn't mean that they didn't make a difference. Because they're still their <coughs> title holders, and that's the same when I went to Mrs. America. So when I competed for Mrs. Utah, I had a support system, and people I didn't even know who were there cheering for me. At Mrs. America, people were cheering for me, and I won the overall swimsuit award at Mrs. America. People were cheering for me, but I didn't win Mrs. America. So I had a standard this time and cheer for something else and congratulate her afterwards. But what they told us at Mrs. America is that only one person can win Mrs. America. But you're all queens. You've already won your state pageants. And you get to go back to your community. And you still get to serve. And like I said, it just took me one try to be Mrs. Utah. But other ladies have to try a whole bunch of times. So I can't be disappointed in what I did. And that's what my uncle told me when I talked to him on the phone afterwards. He said, this is a once in a lifetime experience. How many people have tried? And only 51 of you were there this year, and that's the same every single year. Only 51 of the women can be here. So I want you to think that, again, of those failures in your life. Are you going to let them meet you or break you? So every success I've ever had in my life has come from something that I didn't achieve before. And that's what I'm here today. I still get to be Mrs. Utah for the next six months. And beyond Mrs. Utah, I still get to serve. Whether I have a crown and sash, I'm still able to give back to my community. And that's what I encourage every single one of you. So make a goal of what you have in your life and believe in yourself. Because when you believe, you will achieve. Spontaneous outburst of applause. Thank you. I had my first standing ovation when I was 19 years old. 19 years old, 70,000 people jumped to their feet, and gave my performance a standing ovation. It was at Arizona State University, the big football stadium. Yep, they jumped up and cheered for me because I was on the other football team and I just missed a field goal. <laughs> yeah, they were happy. I wasn't happy. It was on television. I think every human being I know on the planet saw me miss that field goal. I thought that was the lowest part of my entire life. I was wrong. 
Four minutes later, I got my second standing ovation when I missed my second field goal. <laughs> How many of you have ever suffered disappointment? Yeah. Paul Harvey once said this, I hope one day I have enough of what the world calls success so somebody asks me the secret, I will say, I got up when I got knocked down. And you guys, I got knocked down. I knew I wasn't going to get a scholarship. And I went into my first horrifying depression, and I didn't even know what it was back then. All I know is that it feels like I'm in hell. And I'm so grateful for the people around me that helped pull me out of it. In fact, you know what's kind of interesting? People ask me, well, well Bob, why do you go out? I speak to, to a lot of schools, too. I, I'm a substitute teacher on days that I'm not speaking in you know, arenas and things. And so one of the kids goes, well, why are you doing this? And I said, I'll tell you why. 14 years ago, my doctor called me and says, Bob, the little tumor we took out of your chest spread from somewhere else in your body, and I'm sorry to tell you this, it's a metastatic adenocarcinoma. You probably have about a year to live. Now, he was wrong, but I didn't know that for 28 days. What would you do if you found out you had a year to live? Well, I had learned gratitude. I picked up my camera. It was April. It was snowing, and I started filming and go, kids, I just found out I've got a year to live, and I want you to know I am grateful for every day of life I have with you. And then I got practical. I called the dentist and canceled my dentist appointment because I thought, I'm not going there anymore. <laughs> and my daughter at the time was only 14 years old. She sits me down, very concerned. Dad, I've got a question. I said, sweetie, what is it? Dad, do you have life insurance? <laughs> I go, yeah, why? Is there any chance we could get some money for some clothes? I mean, not today, but you know. So for 28 days, I lived with the news it was all over. 28 days later, the Huntsman Cancer Center calls me and says, Bob, we made a mistake. You're okay? I was grateful. Then I got practical. I got my dentist appointment back. And then I took my daughter shopping for clothes because I didn't want her to be disappointed I wasn't going to die. But would that be a tough 28 days? Somebody once said, when you're in a hard place, you might be in the middle of your next inspirational story. There was a little girl in my neighborhood, 13 years old, going through chemotherapy for a brain tumor. She had no hair on her body. When she heard about me in that 28 days, this 13-year-old shows up at my door with a plate of cookies and says the words that changed my life when she said, call me anytime, day or night. I know what you're going through and I think I can help. And in that moment, a 13-year-old lifted the spirits of an international motivational speaker in his time of need, and we all take our turns. But because she did that, I asked myself this question, why can't I do what she just did for me? And from that day forward, I wake up every morning and I say, who can I inspire today? Who can I live today? Who can I make laugh today? And sometimes it was 30,000 people in the Georgia Dome down in Atlanta or 1,400 kids in Iowa at a high school assembly. Guys, more often than not, it's the lady behind the counter at the convenience store, her name's Linda. She knows when I walk in, she's gonna smile, laugh, and we're gonna have fun that I just popped in. And you know what? It's really interesting, that little girl survived. Three years ago, I'm at Utah Valley University, and I'm on the big stage, and she's in the front row, and I go, y you're here. She goes, yeah, I heard you were speaking. And I tell the story, every time I speak, it's what's called the signature story, and I walked off the stage and I said, this is the little girl who showed up at my door with a plate of cookies and changed my life. There's no such thing as a small act of kindness. Each act creates a ripple with no logical end. And I tell these kids, hey, how many of you personally know somebody dealing with panic, depression, or anxiety? And you know how many hands go up? Almost every one of them. In the schools, 10,000 people up in Canada the year before COVID, almost every hand went up and I said, statistically 30% of you, now it's 40, 30% of you are probably in the room with me. And I said, listen, I said, if you're dealing with sadness, that won't go away. That might be depression. Or you're all wound up inside and it won't go away. That might be anxiety. And I say, please let someone help you. Don't try to take this on yourself. And you know, this is what my careers look like. My mother always wondered when I was going to get a real job, but I was the guy that kind of cheered everyone up. But I would, I would bring someone up on the stage and I said, hey, she could use some cheering up. Would you like to help me cheer? Uh, Linda up, and here's what, what it looks like. Everybody, one, two, three, let's go! Everybody, one, two, three, let's go! The next one's actually Salt Lake. With the, with the one, two, three, let's go! 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 But here's my point. Doesn't that guy on stage look like he's really got to put together? like he's bulletproof, like he's got it all figured out. The guy you're looking at on that stage in 2000, that guy right there is hiding behind a mask of depression, sadness. He's struggling really hard. And for some reason, when he was on stage, he was okay. But when I walked off stage, I had an event happen in, 20, in 2010 
where when I walked off that stage, I curled up in a ball in the, in the green room and went into massive, unbelievable, debilitating panic attacks. And I didn't even know what it was. I had no clue. But it's like a bear is chasing you, but there's no bear. And my stomach would get all tightened up, like, because all the blood leaves your core. And I couldn't think. And I was going, what is going on with me? And I didn't know. And by the way, after four months of that, I remember that each day I would go, it's three o'clock. How am I going to make it to four? And I remember the day the awareness hit me. I know why people end their life. I had no idea. It's not to end their life. It's to end the pain. It was horrifying. In fact, after four months of this, my medical doctor says, Bob, we got to do something. You're going to die. He said, the cortisol that's ripping through your body, which is a stress hormone, and all the adrenaline, it's damaging your internal organs. You already have an arrhythmia. He goes, we've got to figure this out. And I said, I've already spent $40,000 on psychologists, psychiatrists, counselors, uh, voodoo doctors, energy healers, oil. I said, I don't know what else to do. And fortunately, he knew a guy named Dr. Ludmil Mana that he referred me to. And this guy did something that no one else did. He got me to actually feel my emotions from my childhood. Because one of the things they do is they check your childhood traumas. And by the way, just to give you an idea, these came out of my journal. I went back in my journal and read through the time when I was really struggling. Those are actual words that came out. I can't take in a deep breath. I have a pit in my stomach. It feels like my chest is going to burst. By the way, if anybody gets triggered, feel free to just step out. You can do that, because I do that accidentally. I don't want to, but that's how horrifying it was. And I didn't know what to do. And then I learned about depression. And I saw this picture. When somebody has a normal brain activity under an fMRI, you're lit up like a Christmas tree. But then like a, like a, a hair dryer that gets too heated up, it shuts down. That's what depression looks like. And, and it does. It feels like you're in hell. I would take, I had shoulder surgery. I had my shoulder ripped out. I would take that physical pain any day over that. That is the most horrifying place to be. So when somebody ends their life, I go, I understand. I get it. And by the way, this is what it looks like. You're always tired. You don't want to even get out of bed. You're irritable. You'll have nothing as fun, profound sadness, and hopelessness. I remember my doctor saying, I know you don't think it'll get better, but it will one day. And I didn't believe him. I did, it just got to a point. And by the way, let me talk about trauma for a second. I'm going to, you see, this is my journey from panic to peace. I'm going to tell you my story because I'm not a psychologist or psychiatrist. I'm not here to, to do anything but tell you my story and see if it resonates to help you understand. When I did this for the military, they said, we're having you here for three reasons. One, to give hope to those that are going through it. Two, to give courage to those that are behind the mask that are afraid to let someone know. And three, to give understanding to those who have no idea what this looks like. Trauma, a deeply distressing or disturbing event. Has it been processed or did you repress it? Two kids can see the same event. One is damaged and one is not. One shoves it down to the cellular level and the other one, they cry and they get it out and it's all taken care of. Let me give you an example of the bird. That's me feeding a baby robin when I was 11 years old. You guys, every year, I would go find a baby robin and I would raise it. When I was a senior in high school, I'm on the football team, but when track season came, I've got a baby bird in my, my sweater that I snuck into school, and you've got to feed it every 20 minutes from sunup to sundown. By the way, I did this my whole life. All of Utah County knew Bob knows how to take care of any bird, whether it's a hummingbird, a magpie, whatever. In 2010, when I was going through my massive trauma, I had 20 baby birds in my backyard. A lot of them had to be fed every 20 minutes, and when I went out to speak, I paid somebody $50 to $100 a day to take care of them when I was gone. Was I obsessed? I didn't know what obsession was. And then Dr. Manov got me to feel it. See, I was aware of it. This is what happened. I'm five years old. I found a baby robin. And looking at the baby robin, go, well, here's how you fly. Look at the other birds. Five years old, right? And I threw it up and it dropped. And I picked it up and I go, no, you move your little wings. I remember doing this. Here, this is how it works. And I threw it up and it dropped. And then I got really mad because that's what kids do when they don't get their way. And I took the bird and I threw it at the ground and I killed it. The little five-year-old went, stupid bird. The 55-year-old that finally processed it sobbed for hours and hours cathartically. I didn't know what was going on, but it just came out, came out, came out. And four years later, my daughter says, Dad, have you noticed for the first time in four years you haven't raised one baby bird? I go, that's how that works. I had a savior complex. I had to, 
I could not, somebody called me in Ogden and said, we've got a baby sparrow. My world stopped and I went up and got the bird. Now I say, go put it back in the tree, the mother will take care of it. By the way, just as an example, other traumas, kindergarten. My kindergarten teacher embarrassed me in front of the whole class. I had no idea how much trauma was behind that. A bullies, the bullies in school caused me trauma. My parents, my parents did a great job, but you know, when they rejected me or sent me to my room, I felt it different than maybe another kid would. Or coaches, I had a coach actually put, I'm a loser on all our helmets when we lost 52 to 14 against Depew. I remember it. One third of the team quit. I thought, no big deal. Oh my gosh, you ought to see the trauma and rage. I had all of this rage that had to come out. And then I had all of the sadness that had to come out. And by the way, for those of you that want to read about it, I found this article, How to Get Rid of Your Repressed Anger, by Jordan Gray. And I say, take a picture of it, you can look it up. But he talks about, you feel your emotions. You don't suppress them. If you feel anger, I tell people, go into your car where nobody can hear you and scream and get it out. Or the, in the prison, they actually have a timeout room where they can go in and just beat the crap out of a punching bag. They don't want them to suppress it because you'll blow up or if you get really good at suppressing it, you'll probably die in your 50s of cancer or a heart attack because your immune system goes down. It's not healthy to not feel your emotions. And I didn't know that. So this is what I was taught. If something's bothering you, just avoid it. Or manage it. And I'll tell you some of the ways I manage it, but some people drink to manage it. Some people smoke to manage it. Some people go shopping to manage it. Or buck up. You know what I learned? If something bothered me, I started leaning into it. I started putting myself right into that situation until one, one day ago, oh, this doesn't bother me anymore. Those were the little skills I learned along the way. And you can read the article and it talks about that. So you take the time to process and somebody says, what does processing look like? For me, it was feeling all of this rage. I didn't know how much rage I had inside of me. It's just a little boy who never grew up because a little kid goes, I didn't get my way, ah! Well, unfortunately, there's a lot of adults that do that too. Just get on the freeway. And then a lot of times under that is a lot of sobbing. And that's how I was processing. And this went on for eight months, eight months. And finally one day I went, oh, the panic attacks went away. Oh, the sadness has gone away. This is great, but I still had this anxiety. And I thought, I am a motivational speaker. I'm going to figure this out. So the first thing I studied was positive psychology. The answer, I've got to just be more positive, right? Well, I actually met a young lady. She was in her 30s. She was the top salesperson for the sales organization. And I go, you don't need positive psychology. My gosh, you're one of the most positive people I've ever met. Are you just always happy? She goes, uh-huh. I said, were you always like this? She goes, oh, no. She goes, when I was 13 years old, my teacher gave us all a sheet of paper and said, you put a check mark on this paper every time you complain today. She said, at the end of the day, I, the whole thing was filled up. And she goes, this is unacceptable. 13 years old, she's rewiring her brain. I set a goal to go 10 minutes without complaining, then a half hour, then an hour, then a week, then a month. She goes, I never complain anymore. And by the way, the way I learned it was, instead of going, it would be better if, I'd catch myself and think about my thinking. Like instead of going, it'd be better if I got first, upgraded to first class. It'd be better if there were 40,000 people. It'd be better if there was pizza in the green room. I would go, oh, my life rocks. I'd catch myself every time. Why does it rock? Because it could be worse. And after you heal childhood trauma, you're always between better or worse, no matter what's going on. If you think about it, it would be better if you're not grateful and it feels yucky. But if you go, hey, my life rocks, do you know that after three months, I actually rewired my brain? Here's the day that I found out I did. I'm down in Mexico. My friend's driving recklessly. He goes off an embankment, out of control, and we roll end over end, side over side, violently. He goes, are you all right? I said, I think my neck's broken. Because I was like this, and I couldn't move my head without all this pain shooting through my body. So I am laying on the ground in Mexico, in a desert, with what I think is a broken neck and a giant gash in the back of my head. And listen to what I say. Hello, everyone. I'm grateful. I just want you to know that I just got my first car accident. We rolled twice. Great fun. Found out it wasn't a broken neck, but a broken clavicle where the seatbelt saved my life. And my phone is bent a little bit. <laughs> so then I get to the hospital in Mexico. And the x-ray machine didn't work. So they put me on a gurney and rolled me across the street to the other hospital. Why go around the curb when you could go over it? 
Then they noticed that the sun was in my eyes, and one of the guys puts a towel over my face, and I start laughing. I go, don't do that. They'll think I'm dead. <laughs> and right here, I'm pointing up, and I'm laughing uncontrollably, because there were two vultures circling right over my head. I go, this can't be good. But was I positive? And you know what I learned? I had rewired my brain, and life was a little bit better, but I became the most positive, anxious person every single day. That wasn't the answer. And then I learned about gratitude, and I studied gratitude. And there's a guy named Takeda Wahia. He was the richest man in all of Japan. My friend interviewed him, and he asked him this question. What makes you so successful? He goes, I'm grateful a thousand times a day. He goes, what? Yeah, what I do is I buy up a company. When I have controlling interest, I get the whole group together and say, we're going to be grateful a thousand times a day. If they don't buy into it, I sell the company. But if they buy into it, everything changes, because they live in a state of gratitude. Now, that takes a lot of work. Let me tell you what Dr. Edmonds from UC Davis found out. He did a study where he said, write down one thing you're grateful for and five reasons why. Go deep. I'm grateful for my mother. Why? Well, she cooks and da, 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 whatever it is, okay? He said another group, he had them be grateful for five different things. And the third group, just tell us why your life is so great. And the group that went one reason why every morning and wrote it down five deep, they actually experienced a better semester as far as happiness goes, than the other two. So that's something you could do. So I did that, and I got good at it, and I spoke on it, and I became the most positive, grateful, anxious person every single day. <laughs> that wasn't the answer. But then I learned about the happiness factor with Simon Sinek, and I learned, I did an event with this gentleman. He's from the University of Texas, and he has a course on happiness. If you're so smart, why aren't you happy? And he said, there are a few things we can actually do because, you know, if you haven't got it mastered and haven't healed everything, you know, sometimes we're just kind of blah, right? Did you know there's some things we can do to actually make ourselves a little bit happier? You want to see a couple? Okay, everybody stand up for a second. And we talked about the power pose. And what you do when you're standing there, you put your hands over your head like you just broke a world record. Come on, be proud about it. And go, yeah! Yeah! And they have found, somebody told me that if you do this for 10 minutes before you interview for a job, you will have more confidence. Now, don't do it in the foyer where everyone could see you. That would be really silly. Okay, or like Superman or Wonder Woman. Because when somebody's not in a good mood, what are you doing? Your body's like this. No, we're going to be like this. We're going to fool ourselves. Okay, everyone sit down. How many of you are thinking Bob had three Red Bulls before he got here today? You know what my son said? Dad, when you speak, you're like a mosquito on cocaine. Oh, by the way, to give you a little preview, he said, but Dad, it used to be you couldn't turn that off. You were like that from the time you woke up to the time you went to bed. Okay, kids, get together. We're going to get to the boat. We're going to go. He goes, you were a lot of fun, but we walked on eggshells around you because Dad, you couldn't sit still for five minutes. Dad, what happened to you? You just sat with me for an hour looking me in the eye, and you're so calm. Dad, are you on drugs? If you are, this is a really good one. <laughs> So there actually was an entire transformation of my personality because I grew up. In fact, I used to be this patient. I'd walk into McDonald's and go, what's ready? <laughs> now my kids go, geez, Dad, you've got amazing patience. What did you do? I grew up. When I healed my childhood trauma, I got more patient, more loving, and I went, that's how this works? Let's go back to something else you could do. Smile. Everybody smile. Maybe you're in a bad mood. And you're driving in your car and you just smile. And look in the mirror and you go, oh, look at me. You know? And in fact, look at someone else who's smiling. Just look at each other, you know? <laughs> and theoretically, there, it releases some neurotransmitters and your brain's going, oh, I guess they want to be happy. <laughs> but, but here's my favorite one, you guys. I learned this from Loretta LaRouche, who studied stress at Harvard University for 30 years. Now she's this great speaker. She's in her 80s. And I asked, can I... Can I share this with others? And she said, yeah. So here it is. She goes, we need to have a good laugh every day. And, you know, the cynical person goes, oh, you want me to laugh? I'm oh, fine. <laughs> she goes, no, a belly laugh, like Santa Claus. So everybody grab your belly. If you don't have one, reach over to someone else and grab their belly. <laughs> and what we're going to do together is we're going to have a belly laugh together for 15 seconds. Are you ready? Begin. <laughs> <laughs> you ought to see what happens with 10,000 people doing that. They can't even stop for five or 10 minutes. But if you bought into it, didn't it raise your mood a little bit? You know, so there are things we can do. And you know what? One day I learned. I am the most grateful, positive, happy, 
anxious person every single day. And just making a long story short, you guys, there's all these people who say, this is the answer, this is the answer. I became the most positive, grateful, happy, motivated, meditative, affirmative, service, prayerful, blah, 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 anxious person every day. And then I learned they're Band-Aids. You know how you know it's a Band-Aid? It doesn't last. It's not a permanent change. And I just go, you know what, maybe I just have to take drugs. And then I met a guy named James Hadlock from Midway, Utah. And everybody kept telling me, you need to meet James. And they called James and said, you need to meet Bob. You two need to get together. So he calls me up, and my mind was in a fog. When you're in anxiety, you're in a fog. Because the blood leaves your frontal lobe, and you just can't think straight. He calls me, hey, can we, you want to go to lunch? And I just go, sure. I show up at lunch, and he's there with his wife. And I felt like I had just met, like, Jesus Christ and Mother Teresa. It was <laughs> the most beautiful couple I'd ever met. And he was just very calm. You know how people just emanate love? And he sits there like this. Bob, let me tell you a little bit about my life. I've overdosed over 60 times. I was a drug addict. My parents thought they were going to find me dead in a hotel one day. He goes, I've got footage of five Salt Lake City police cars chasing me before I hit a pole because I was high. I'm a convicted felon. And he's going on like this. And then he says this. One, he's being authentic, right? He says, there's nothing you can tell me about you that would ever make me think less of you. No judgment whatsoever. And they said this, Bob, I, you like to stay busy, don't you? I go, yeah. He goes, you hate being bored. It drives you nuts, doesn't it? I go, yeah, how'd you know? He goes, Bob, that's your addiction. Look it up. Busy is an addiction. Other people use drugs or alcohol or whatever. You use busy to push away the pain. You can't sit still. You've got to keep moving. It didn't work, did it? I go, no. He goes, here's what you did next. You thought, I'll reframe it. I go, what do you mean? Oh, you mastered how to take a negative to a positive, an ungrateful to a grateful. You do it automatically. You reframe everything. But it didn't work, did it? I go, well, no. Then he blew my mind when he said this. Bob, I've been watching all these schools you do for free. You thought if I serve enough people, I will feel better. If you are serving others to feel better, you're going to burn out if you haven't already. If you feel inspired, that's beautiful. You're doing it to push away the pain. And this is what I said about like this to give you an idea of my personality back then in the restaurant. All right, so what do you got? And he laughed. I'm going to teach you how to get connected to yourself, connected to others, and you're going to calm down. Great, how do you do that? And he laughed again. By the way, just making a long story short, eight months later, he said, you don't need me anymore. And I was calm. And I'll take you through a few of the things I learned in that journey. First was connection to self. And he began with, he always taught metaphors. He goes, I'm not going to teach you anything. I'm going to point, 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 kind of like math. I don't get it, I don't get it. Oh, now I get it. And he says, Bob, did you ever have a teddy bear or a blanket that made you feel good? I go, well, yeah. He says, okay, imagine the teddy bear sitting over there. What magical properties come out of a teddy bear to make you feel better? I went, well, nothing, really. He goes, good, that takes some people 30 minutes to get there. He said, so where is the beautiful feeling coming from? I go, oh, it's in here. He goes, Bob, it's always there, but sometimes you can't feel it because your mind is making too much noise. And I didn't even understand what he was saying back then. But he, I did understand this part. Hey, Bob, what magical teddy bears are people chasing because they think something out there will make them feel good inside? What would your answers be? Money, fame, nice car, nice house, relationship, honors, degrees. And he said this. Are there people that have all of that they are still miserable? I go, well, yeah. I'm one of them. He goes, you know why? You're looking in the wrong direction. It's in here. I'm going to get you to start reflecting, looking inside instead of looking for it out there. And then it got, went to this one. Hey, Bob, can someone or something make you mad? I asked 1,400 United States Air Force officers that at McCullough Air Force Base, and almost every hand went up. How many of you would raise your hand? Could somebody make you mad? OK. I asked all the counselors in the state of Utah that question. Nobody raised their hand. I asked all the psychologists at that Air Force base, nobody raised their hand, and here's why. You learn this, your life changes. No one makes you mad. You're triggered. The feeling comes from within you. It's like the little boy who says to his mother, Mommy, where are all the stupid idiot drivers today? They only come out when your father's driving. Do you guys get it? Two people see the same event, one gets triggered, one does not. You're playing golf, somebody hits it in the water, 
I would break my club and throw it in afterwards while the other guy's laughing when he hits it in the water. What's different? It's what's going on in me. Has, is there ever something that used to upset you that doesn't anymore? What changed? Not what's going on out there, what's going on inside. And if you start to reflect and look inside all the time, and you go, huh, I'm feeling a, an anger. That's fascinating. There's no judgment, because here's the next question. Is anger bad? I was taught anger is bad. You need, to, you need to control your anger. You know, anger is of the, and you know what, and all the stuff about, what's controlling your anger? That's suppressing again, right? No, anger, oh God. Somebody just told me this in high school. Anger is a secondary emotion covering pain or frustration. When somebody's ticked off, I go, oh, and your world changes. Oh, they're having a hard time today. Oh. And if I'm not triggered, I can sit there and be compassionate and go, oh, my son knew this before I knew it, because 10 years ago when I was still a mess, I was upset about something, and he goes, Dad, it looks like you need a hug. He got it. He knew something was going on inside of me. So you guys, when I finally started understanding this, and I had already healed all my triggers of my childhood, and, and by the way, I don't get angry anymore. It's the craziest thing. My kids have noticed it. In fact, my son says, Dad, I'm going to set a goal to get you ticked because I just never see you get mad anymore. <laughs> what is going on with you? And I didn't know that was possible. I have somebody go, I don't want to offend you. And I go, I don't think you can, but give it a shot. This one guy goes, you're an idiot. I go, not only that, my IQ is not very high either. <laughs> I mean, because I wasn't triggered. So I got into a cab a few years ago with a friend of mine who's known me for 15 years. We're up in Alaska, jump in the cab, and I tell him where we're going. And the guy hit the gas like we're in the Daytona 500. So I leaned forward and I said, sir, I was in a rollover last year. Any chance you could go a little slower? Well, he was triggered. He slams on the brakes. He hits the steering wheel. I'm not kidding you. He turns around and he says, hey, it's been a year. You should be over it. My friend backs up like this. And I go, oh. And I get really interested because I go, oh, he's having a hard day. Now, I don't say that because when somebody's angry or upset emotionally, the blood leaves your frontal lobe and you will do and say things you normally wouldn't do or say. True or false? True. Yeah, 10 years ago. I took my phone and threw it at the wall. Just before it hit the wall, I went, that's going to be expensive. The blood came back too late. That's why you never write a note to a friend you're upset with, to a spouse. You have to settle down. You pause. You wait till you settle down so you can think clearly, okay? That was another great thing I learned. Just, <laughs> you can write it, but then burn it or read it the next day. So anyway, he's screaming at me, and I'm just sitting there looking at him. And then I said, is there more? Yeah, there's more. And he went on. And then you watch for this. And I tell the kids in the schools, watch this with your parents, with your teachers, your coaches, where they go, <sighs> the blood just came back. You validate them. You know what, sir, you're probably right, but my nerves are shot. Is there any chance we could go slower? And he went, okay. But then he came, became my best friend all the way to the hotel, telling us all the places we needed to see before we left. Here's the funny part. I got out of the cab with my friend who's known me for 15 years, and he goes, What's going on with you? I go, what? <laughs> Bob, I know three years ago you would have ripped his head off. I've seen you break all the golf clubs in your bag. And now you laugh when the ball goes in the water. What is going on with you? Healed childhood trauma, and now I see the world differently because I'm reflecting and looking inside. Is that helpful, you guys? Okay, so I love this from Robin Williams. Everyone you meet is fighting a battle you know nothing about. Be kind always. When I see somebody acting out, and we'd go, what a jerk. I don't say that anymore. I go, what happened in his life that he's acting like that? Because I was a jerk. I did a lot of stupid things. I did the best I could with what I knew at the time. I don't get to do those anymore. I don't want to. But that's really helpful to know. Now, it's interesting. My daughter, Dolly, by the way, let me tell you about Dolly a little bit. Uh, I was really sore from playing pickleball. She goes, Dad, you look sore. Dad, just take drugs. You're at the end of your life anyway. <laughs> she saw her little sister fixing her hair. Anna, why are you so concerned with how you look? Look at Dad. He doesn't care what people think. <laughs> but she's 26 now. She calls me from Houston. Dad, you know what I just learned? I go, what? I'm not always right. Did you know that? <laughs> I go, honey, there are 80-year-olds that don't know that. But anyway... She called me one day, she's in her 20s, Dad, we love this new version of you, you're so calm, would you have raised us differently? I go, Dolly, the problem with parenting is by the time you're experienced, you're unemployed. <laughs> but yeah, I would have raised you differently. She goes, how, Dad? Well, I used to always tell this story about the car seat. This is when Dolly was a little girl, 
let me tell you about her personality. I'm holding her as a baby, and I'm looking in her eyes, and she's looking up at me like to say, I'm smarter than you are. Not much changed. Anyway, we're going down the freeway, and she gets out of her car seat all by herself. Isn't that a great day in a parent's life? And being the parental pygmy that I was, I looked in the rearview mirror and said, get back in your car seat. She's looking at me like, yeah, right. I go, get back in your car seat or else. And she's looking at me like, bring it on. So I pull over to the side of the road. I get out of my car and I stopped and I paused. Because at the time somebody said, don't go with your first reaction. Pause, relax, and see what else pops into your head. You know those inspired thoughts that we get? It comes when our mind is clear. You know like a snow globe, if you shake it up, it's all cloudy. Like I'm weighing all the pros and cons. And I can't think clearly, but then in the shower or we're driving somewhere when we're not thinking about anything and we're just calm, boom, the answer pops into our heads. Does that happen to you guys too? Yeah. So I paused, not really knowing what was going on. And by the way, back then, this is what I said. And you know, for some of you, you could say it's God. Some of you will say it's your higher power, whatever you want to say. But this is what I said. I looked up, I said, she's your daughter. What do you want me to do with her? And I actually paused. And you know what came into my mind? Give her a hug. And this is me. Not feeling like a hug. You getting more ideas? And I promise, the next thought that popped into my head was, if you're not going to listen, don't ask anymore. So I went to the other side of the car, opened up the door. She's standing there ready for a fight because we've done this before. And I go, this isn't going to work. And I, I went, Dolly, come give Daddy a hug. I'd never seen her behave like this. She completely melted, ran straight across, jumped into my arms, wrapped her arms around my neck, and started crying uncontrollably. She had never cries. When she was done crying, I said, are you ready to go home? She goes, mm-hmm. And we didn't have another problem all the way home. She goes, by the way, Dad, I figured that out. I go, what? You finally gave me what I was looking for as a little girl, my father's love. Yeah, now you tell me. But I've been doing this with my other daughter who was in her teenage years, and it works really good. The best thing to do with the person who's in front of you, wait for that inspired thought in that moment with that person instead of, well, I said we're going to, no, what would be best now? And I've got some stories that go with that, but let's go to connection to others. This is so important, and like you were talking about, people were isolated. Folks, there's a, a book called Lost Connections. We need physiologically and psychologically to be connected to each other. That's how we got this far on the planet, okay? And when we don't have it, we find out that there are connection killers, like distractions. So my daughter, I get a call from her friends one day, she's 17 years old at the time, and her friends go, we're taking, Dal uh, we're taking Anna to the hospital right now. I said, why? She told us she was thinking of driving her car into a truck. And I had taught my daughter and all of her friends, if anyone under 25 years old, you ask these two questions. Are you thinking of hurting yourself? Do you have a plan? If they have a plan, you don't let them out of your sight and you get them to a professional and find out if they're in danger or not. They took her to the emergency room. You know what we found out? She was suffering from massive depression for four years, but she looked like she was the happiest girl on the planet because she thought that was her job. Had no idea. Anyway, she's doing a lot better now, but she taught me something five or six years ago, and I do these one minute with Bob's, and this is the one I did with my daughter. I'm here with my daughter, Anna, and this morning at breakfast, she showed me what she just got. What did you just get? She got a flip phone. She has a flip phone. Why did you get a flip phone? Uh, because my smartphone was depressing me, and <laughs> I had and I was addicted to it, and so I went back to my flip phone because it makes life better. And does it feel better? Much better. Love it. So I started researching electronics, and this was back five years ago, and I had school counselors going, well, that's anecdotal, that's not real. I go, this, this is, screen time is making our kids moody, crazy, and lazy. Well, those of you with little brothers and sisters, how many of you know that's probably true? And maybe even for you. In fact, then I saw this one. Smartphone addiction causes an imbalance in the brain that makes people tired. Did you know the number one complaint to doctors right now is I can't sleep? There's three things that screw up your deep sleep. Alcohol, caffeine, and blue light that comes off of electronics. Um, and, and by the way, then I show them this one. And this is interesting in the schools. I go, smartphone addiction could be changing your brain. And by the way, the brains of our kids are different than they were 10, 15 years ago. They don't have the bone density of the kids 10, 15 years ago. It's all different. They can't talk to others like they did back then. But I go, 69% of parents, and I say to the kids, now, it's not your parents' fault. They're addicted too. 
By the way, here's the addictive feature you buy, you guys. It's called an intermittent variable reward. If you're playing slot machines in Vegas, I lose, I lose, I lose, I win. I got hit with dopamine. I lose, I lose, I lose, I lose. Ah, I got hit with dopamine. I'm scrolling. Ha! Ah, funny. Look at that. Dopamine. And they said they did this on purpose to get you addicted to these things. And the guys who invented this hire nannies to keep their kids off of all electronics. That's how serious that is. But it's hard to self-regulate yourself if you're under 25 years old. But here's what I say to the kids in the schools. How many of you have parents that seem to ignore you on a regular basis because they keep looking at their phones? How many of the kids' hands do you think go up? A lot of them. And then I do a little demonstration, especially if the parents are there. I go, I need a volunteer. One of you girls like to volunteer? I need you to just pretend I'm your dad and you want to tell me something cool that happened at school and kind of be persistent. You want to do that? Okay, pretend I'm your dad. Come on up. And just, yeah. <laughs> Do I start? Uh-huh. Okay. Um, wait a second. Today I went to jazz class. Cool. Hold I, wait, 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 wait. Oh my gosh, this is funny. Okay, what? I learned, I learned about isolations <laughs> and it made me feel really powerful and it really helped me feel my inner That's That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, really By the way, how would this make you feel? Not very nice. <laughs> Some kids have said it makes me feel sad and I had a couple boys that said I feel like I want to hit you. Okay, take two. Okay, we're enacting, you come up again, do it. Okay. Father. Hold on. <laughs> What's up? How was your day? Oh, great. Yeah. That's good. How was yours? Oh, it was wonderful. I, I went to dance class and I had a great time. <laughs> and you're smiling, that's awesome. Okay, does this feel better? And you know why? Because the most important person, if you do it like this, life changes. The most important person on the planet is the one who's right in front of you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Tiger Woods said when his, fa when his fa he asked his father a question, his dad would get down on one knee and look him in the eye and talk to him the whole time. I know a fourth grade teacher who now does this with every kid who walks in the class, and all of the behavioral problems for third grade are gone with her fourth grade class because sometimes the only connection those kids are going to get is with their teacher. They don't get it from their parents. So connection is so darn important. My daughter, the one who went through depression, if she's with a friend and her friend's looking at her phone, put that stupid thing away, look me in the eye and talk to me. So that brings us on to listening. Listening is so important. And I, by the way, I speak at the prison every year. I love these, those guys. They're amazing. And we did a listening exercise. And it's, it's prefaced with this. How many of you have noticed that when somebody's talking to you, you're already thinking about what you're going to say next? Human connection's broken. How many of you have noticed you can't wait till they shut up because you've got a one-up story on them? <laughs> yeah, you went to Hawaii, I went to Tahiti. <laughs> or I love old people. I hurt my knee. Well, I had a knee replacement. Well, I had two knee replacements and a shoulder. And, or girls, the athletes. Did you see me throw that touchdown? Well, yeah, he could have done that without me blocking. I mean, the, if we're not listening to the other person, Connection's been broken, and this is a big one. This was a giant epiphany for me. Judgment is a connection killer. And when he said that to me, I wasn't really quite sure until I went home, and I saw my son, 30 years old, and I said, hey, Thomas, let's go to a movie. Dad, I can't go to a movie with you. I go, why? Dad, when I was a little boy, there was something inappropriate on TV, and you walked in and said, hey, we don't watch stuff like that in this house. He said, to this day, when you walk in the house, I'm 30 years old. If the TV's on, I'm scared to death that you're standing behind me. <laughs> Now, that's a childhood trauma he's going to have to heal, but this was the question I asked. Thomas, how come you never told me that before? Dad, I don't know what's going on with you. You love everybody. You don't judge everybody, anybody. He goes, when I was a little boy, the way you judged Uncle Mike for playing golf on Sunday or not being spiritual enough, I didn't feel safe to tell you anything. And then it hit me. Oh, you know how you see something you didn't see before? If I judge someone, it's like, if you told me something, I go, well, that's stupid. I just judged you. you want, she's not going to tell me anything. Either would any of you if you saw me do that to her. What if we could sit with another person with nothing on our mind just to get connected? And that's what my coach taught me. He says, Bob, you need to get connected to other people every single day. And he taught me how to do it. So would you like to see how to listen? Just, and you can do this with anybody you want if they'll let you. I need a volunteer who can have a discussion with me sitting up here in front and look me in the eye for three or four minutes without freaking out. Because not everybody can. My two boys still won't do this with me, my girls do. 
Okay, you, you can do it? Yeah. Now your job is to watch us. And by the way, we can quit anytime you want, okay? I did this with a former NFL football player and he goes, I can't do this, there's too much pain behind my eyes. Okay, let's go up here so these two could, or you two girls go sit back one row and you can watch. All right. And we can quit anytime you want. What's your name, by the way? Karen. Karen. I'm Bob. So Karen, I'm gonna ask you a question, and this is just a connection exercise. I'm gonna ask you a question and when you're done talking, I'm gonna wait two or three seconds. I now have a habit of this because you might have more to say. And then when it's your turn, ask me a question like something about my life or one of my kids where I gotta tell a little bit of a story, not what's your favorite color, an open-ended one, okay? okay? All right, and stay on my left eye the whole time. If you look away, I'll just go like that to remind you. The left eye? Yeah, right here. Okay. Okay, all right, do you want an easy question or a hard question? Okay, stay here. I want a hard question. Really? Um, okay. Tell me one of the most difficult days of the last couple years. That's a hard question. And we don't have to do that. We can switch to something no, else. Okay. okay, stay here. Okay. Um, there's a few. <laughs> I'm picking one. Uh, a few years ago, it's been more than a couple of years ago, my sister rejected me and told me she was divorcing me. That's a hard one. Okay, tell me about your favorite holiday and why it's your favorite holiday. That's a good one. I still love Christmas. I think it just brings people together and I always feel a lot of love from Christmas. Okay, it's your turn. Stay here. I know, I wanna look at both eyes. <laughs> um, were you in any other accidents like the one in Mexico? Um, I've had all kinds of fun things that should have killed me. I've been in an ultralight where the propeller broke. I've been in a powered parachute where we crashed into the side of a hill. Wow. I've been in, uh, on I-15 just a few months ago where the car in front of me got hit and blew up and I went through the debris field. Um, has, it changed, has it changed your perspective on how you live? Uh, I think what changed my perspective is going through what I've gone through because I actually said to my doctor, I said, you know what, after um, having cancer twice, being in that car accident and there's other things, I go, I look at each day as a bonus day. Like, you know, I shouldn't even be here. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, so does this feel different than a normal conversation? Are you feeling anything different or seeing anything different? I want to look at your whole face. I think that's hard. And then when I think, I want to look up. Like, I got to think about it. But I can't look at you and think at the same time. <laughs> well, actually, it slows your thinking down. Yeah. That football player that spoke 400 miles an hour, because we don't have 15 minutes to do this, he goes, dude, you're blowing my mind. I've never <laughs> thought this slow. <laughs> and he completely calmed down. And he said, I can just see your eye. It's like a tunneling. It's uh, polyvagal theory, and there's a little bone that turns in our ear. If I do this long enough, people say they can't hear anything out there. But here's what's interesting. It slows your thinking down, but there's trust, and we're looking in each other's eyes. It releases oxytocin in our brain, which is stronger than the dopamine of addiction. So my coach, who overdosed over 60 times, spent tons of money trying to get off of drugs. He said when he got connected every day, he said it all fell away. My addiction to busy fell away, to Diet Coke fell away, to sugar fell away, to, and it's just. All the escapes fell away. Yeah. Okay, and so then there's one more piece. How many of you felt a connection while we were doing this? Anybody? When I first did this with somebody who knew me, he goes, Bob, you gotta do that every time. I go, why? He said, I felt it in the audience. I go, what? Mm -hmm. 400 eighth graders at Lake Ridge Junior High. I said, how many of you felt this? And most of the kids' hands went up. I don't know what that is. But I did this with a neuroscientist who's one of the leading authorities on um, concussions. She saw me do this in front. She goes, I want to have a talk with you just doing this. And so, you know, everybody's having dinner and we, we talked for 30 minutes and she goes, I don't know what's going on and I'm a neuroscientist. Mm -hmm. She goes, I want to see this under an fMRI. I don't like talking to people. And she goes, I like talking to you and I don't know why. I wish my husband could do this. I said, you can do this with anybody if they'll let you. Mm -hmm. Because if, like that, that football player said, I got too much pain behind my eyes. I had a couple of special forces guys go, I want to hit you. I go, we can stop right now. <laughs> because they still had a lot of rage and trauma that came from them when they were you know, overseas. So 
He said, Bob, I want you to get connected to somebody every single day. And when you meet somebody new, um, sir, um, I'm working on my anxiety, so I'll be looking you in the eye the whole time. If you don't want me to, it feels uncomfortable, I'll stop. Nobody asked me to stop, but I did hear this many times. I just told you things I've never told anyone before. I don't know why I feel like I can trust you. It blew my mind. That's cool. Thank you. So, when he taught me to look in each other's eyes every day, he says, Bob, now I've got an exercise for you. I go, what's that? I want you to have a 30-minute talk with somebody who you think is your superior and your inferior for 30 minutes. I go, what do you mean? I don't know. It's, it's up to you. Well, I was in Hawaii. I met the president of New York Life. It was just me and him in his beautiful office overlooking Honolulu. And I said, hey, I'm working on my anxiety. My coach wants me to have a 30-minute discussion looking in somebody's eyes. Is that okay? <laughs> And the guy actually said, sure, he was really cool, sure. And so we did it for 30 minutes. I was walking out on the street a while later, and there was a homeless vet on the street. I sat on the street, and I said to him, I'm working on my anxiety. My coach wants me to look in somebody's eyes for 30 minutes and talk. Would you do that with me? And he goes, yeah, sure. And well, what a wonderful person he is. But then I called my coach, and I told him what happened. He says, Bob, so what did you learn? I said, I just learned there is nobody who's superior or inferior. Nobody, everybody's got this divinity or something, even me. And I remember saying this, why didn't you just tell me? He said, you needed to see it for yourself. And once you see it, you can't unsee it. So when I did this in the prison, I looked at the guys and I said, you guys, I love you guys. I don't think of you as inferior at all. In fact, I heard your stories. One of them was four years old when his parents dumped him on the streets of Chicago and he had to survive on his own. I said, it's a miracle you're alive. And one of them came up to me afterwards and said, if the guards could see us the way you see us, we'd never have a problem here. Because they don't see them that way. There's too much judgment going on with each other because that's what we learned. And I was unlearning some of the things that I had learned. This is another huge piece. Do you see people as people? Great book. You know what objectifying is? You've probably heard of it, but he says objectifying is seeing somebody as a vehicle, an obstacle, or simply of no relevance. A vehicle. I'm going to kiss up to my boss because I'm trying to get a promotion. I don't see him as a person. I see him as a vehicle. An obstacle. I'm going to make you look bad so I can crush you and I get the promotion. You're an obstacle. Oh, he's just a janitor. No relevance. You guys, when I told this story to uh, one of my dearest friends who passed away during COVID, he was in his 80s, his wife said, you know, I was walking through the halls. He was a professor, 30,000 students. She said, I was walking through the, his office building, where his office was on campus, and she said the janitor walked up to me and said this, do you know your husband's the only one to talk to me in 20 years on this campus? He knows my name. He knows my wife's name. He knows my kids' names. He's walked with me through my struggles for 20 years. Your husband is the only one on this campus in 20 years that saw me as a person, not as a janitor. And I used to watch him. And I go, why does everybody love this guy? And I finally figured it out. It's because he loved everybody. I took him on a trip with me to Stanford. And when I got back to the hotel room, he was talking to the housekeeper. And he told me all about her life after she left. He knew how many kids she That's what he did. He, we'd walk into the elevator. He'd turn around and go, hi, everybody. Where are you guys from? Tell me more about you. And he'd have con And I just go, he's one of the greatest mentors I've ever met because he taught me that. Now, this is important. After healing childhood trauma, one of the things a psychiatrist does is deal with what's called irrational thought. And I call it the movies of the mind. There's a gal named Byron Katie who wrote a book, Loving What Is, but here's how it works. Who would like to eliminate worrying about something in the future? <laughs> I was a worry wart back at BYU. I snuck into the counseling center. I goes, now this isn't going to be on my record, is it? No one's going to know, are they? Who knew that one day I'd stand on stage and go, yeah, I dealt with depression, anxiety, and panic. I wanted to jump off a cliff. Yeah. But anyway... Being authentic, it's really interesting. Oh, by the way, being single, I would go out and I used to put my best foot forward. Now I sit down and go, yeah, I've been divorced and I got divorced the second time because of my mental illness and panic and depression. And I'm doing better now. And I thought they would run for their life. They'd go like this. <sighs> well, let me tell you what I've been going through. I had no idea that's how it works. Now, a couple people ran for their lives and now, you know, I understand it and it's okay, but I get it. But I call it movies of the mind. I'm going to give you a story in this. Well, first of all, I'm going to start with this. You guys, your emotions are real. If you feel anger, you're having an anger. Hmm, there's an anger. You're feeling a sadness. Okay, fine. You don't judge it. But your feelings are coming from thoughts, and your thoughts aren't real. And somebody said, what do you mean my thoughts aren't real? And I go, okay, well, picture a spider crawling across your face. And some people go like that. Or a snake crawling down your shirt. Or, yeah, some of you are going... 
All right, and I go, is there a spider in the room? Well, no. So you just had a what? A thought all by itself impacted you emotionally, and it's not. Did you ever go to a movie and it's freaking you out? And then you remember, oh, it's not. Okay, so you get the point, right? So American Fork High School, about five years ago, there was a young lady on the soccer team. She had a general anxiety disorder. She was freaking out about everything all the time. And her parents said, could you just talk to her? And at the time, I go, what am I going to say? But I had learned this concept. So I said, what's going on? Oh. I can't sleep at night. I'm freaking out. About what? We have a soccer game on Saturday. I go, and? Oh, I'm afraid I'm going to fall down. I'm afraid the coach is going to yell at me. He's mean. I'm afraid we're going to lose and not go to state this year, and it's going to be my fault. And I go, okay. Uh, can I ask you a question? Are you currently playing soccer on Saturday? Let me remind you it's Tuesday. She goes, what? Are you currently playing soccer right now? She goes, well, well, no. Oh, so did you fall down on Saturday? Well, no. Oh, so you have a thought, and it's not... Real. Oh, did the coach scream at you on Saturday? Did you guys lose and not go to state? She goes, well, no. You have mastered how to freak yourself out. <laughs> Just play a movie of Saturday, and you're going to freak out. I said, you, you've got it down pat. Would you like to find a better way? I always ask permission. She goes, well, yeah. And I said this, and this is what helped me so much. After I healed childhood trauma, what would you experience right now sitting here with me without that movie playing in your head that's not even real? Wake up from the nightmare, be right here, right now. What would you experience? And she looked at her dad and said, geez, dad, I could be happy. Oh my gosh, it's not real. She got it. She got it like that. You guys, I was in my 50s. I was wired. What if she doesn't give me another chance? What if I don't ever speak again? What if I don't have enough for retirement? What if, what if, what if? I kept catching myself and going, what would I experience without that thought? I'd be at peace. And I put post-its all over my house, all over my car, because I got it. And I kept catching myself, catching myself, catching myself, catching myself, catching myself. And one day after three months, I went, oh, I'm here right now. Are you nervous about speaking to 10,000 people next week? No. Why? Because I'm not there. I'm right here. Are you nervous about this next shot in golf? No. Why? I haven't hit it yet. So I said, look, when you have anxiety about something in the future, or sadness or anger about something that's already happened, it's coming from a thought, and it's not. And if you keep repeating that and, re and reviewing that, it will become automatic. Now, once again, there's an exception. I do this for troops. If they came back from Afghanistan and they saw horrible things, or you had a trauma in your life, or a car accident or something, and it plays in your head whether you like it or not, that's why my psychologist asked, do you have nightmares that keep coming back? Well, then you might need a therapist to help you get through that. But after that, I, I love what this gal did from American Fork. She got really angry. I go, why are you mad? You know my sister said to me two days ago? And then she started laughing. I go, why are you laughing? She goes, it's over. <laughs> the only way for me to be mad is to play the movie of two days ago. She's not even in the room. Oh, my gosh. Her general anxiety disorder disappeared. Let me tell you how it helped in my life. Remember I told you I thought I was going to die? I freaked out. I thought of every possible way of dying of cancer that you could think of and missing my kids and everything else, right? Now I'm in the moment. Three years ago, my doctor called me, says, Bob, the CAT scan came back. You have a golf ball size cancerous tumor in your bladder. We're going to operate as soon as possible. When you wake up, we get to tell you one of three things. One, you're going to die. Two, it got into the bladder wall. The only way to save your life is take out your bladder. You're going to have that bag on your side for the rest of your life. Or three, it got into the fatty tissue and with with therapy, you have a 95% chance of living the next five years. By the way, that, to end the drama, that's what it ended up being. But I didn't know that. I went, oh, okay. I'm on the operating table. He's ready to put me under, and he's looking at the anesthesiologist. And he says, have you seen this before? He goes, no. I go, what? Bob, your heart rate is 60. Your blood pressure is normal. Are you concerned at all about the outcome? I go, no, I'm fine. How are you guys? Did everybody have lunch? And I'm cracking jokes, and he goes, I wish everybody could come in like that. We usually have them sedated by the time they get here. They're freaking, well, how are you doing this? I go, well, 10 years ago it wouldn't work. It's a long story, I'll tell you later. <laughs> I had a young lady from Iowa, she was a ninth grader, and she wrote me how she was throwing up before every track meet, and she said, because I realized I was playing movies in my head that aren't real, it completely changed, and now she enjoys the track meet. You know, just, I, I forgot to say this earlier, I just want to throw this out. A great sports psychologist was asked, what do you do to get the kicker ready to kick the winning field goal in the Super Bowl? He goes, I don't get the kicker ready to kick the winning field goal in the Super Bowl. I get him ready to be okay either way. Because your worth has nothing to do with a football going through the uprights. If the fans are upset, who's got the problem, you guys? Who? If the coach is upset, who's got the problem? 
the coach, and I tell my athletes, now don't tell your coach because there's no blood in his frontal lobe right now. And he's got rage, he's got to work out, but it's not your place to be his psychologist, okay? I, I had this coach in Iowa come up to me. You want to hear this little story real quick? This coach in Iowa goes, okay, I can buy into this. So, but one of the players misses his assignment, and I'm ticked off. I'm the one with the problem. I go, uh-huh. I go, coach, what if you did this? When I was in high school, my senior year, I was the defensive end. I forgot to hit the tight end, and the tight end ended up scoring the touchdown. My coach pulled me off the field and screamed at me. And by the way, it was trauma I had to handle in my 50s. But what if he had done this? Hey, Bob, what were you supposed to do on that play? Oh, coach, I forgot. I was supposed to hit the tight end and disrupt his pattern. Just wanted to make sure you know. Or I would have said, I don't know, coach, what? <laughs> on that particular play, make sure you hit the tight end so you can disrupt it. Do you want me to remind you next time we run that play? No, coach, I think I got it. I said, either way, if you upset your player, the blood leaves his frontal lobe, and he's not going to perform well. That's what choking's all about. You guys, if you're ever taking a test and you're freaking out taking the test, you have anxiety, you're thinking, what if I don't get A's? What if I don't get into BYU? What if I don't have perfect grades? What if I don't get married? What if I don't? You're playing a bunch of movies and they're not. You go there, take the test. Well, let's see what happens. Yeah. And you'll think more clearly and remember more. Okay, let me wrap up with... If anybody wants the reading list of how I got to where I got, take a picture of that. The first two books, How to Do the Work, Letting Go, that's How to Heal Childhood Trauma. Loving What Is, I, that's, uh, you know, Movies of the Mind, Lost Connections, we talked about that. Untethered Soul, oh, this one's awesome, you guys. Watch this. You know the talking going on in your head? You know the talking, arguing with the talking? I should get a pizza, I'm trying to lose weight. I should study now. No, I want to do, you know those two talkers in your head? You know the roommate that won't go away, he won't shut up? Okay, which one is you? Okay, so when I, Michael Singer, go listen to this. If you don't like reading, listen to both of these, okay? By the way, there is no stress out there. The stress is in here, what you tell yourself about whatever is going out there. But those of you that think you might be one of these little talkers, can you hear your parents' voice in your head or somebody you know in your head? Are you that person? No. Can you hear music in your head sometimes, whether you like it or not? Are you the music? What you're hearing, a neural pathway is formed under an fMRI. It would go, it would light up. When you have a thought and you connect it to an emotion, it creates a neural pathway, like I'm a loser. And by the way, it's in English, isn't it? It's not in Vietnamese. <laughs> you heard it somewhere, and now you hear it, and you believe what you're hearing. I'm just not good enough. I'm a... No, you heard it, now you're believing it. Let me tell you who, you who you are, and then you can listen to the rest of that. It's the first step to mindfulness. You are the one who's observing what's going on in your head. But look at those two argue. That's just fascinating. And we, what you're doing is you're noticing instead of thinking about it. Let me just give you the quick exercise of noticing. Everybody name five things in the room real quick. Go. Name five things. Okay, did anybody say table? Okay, okay. How much, th oh, what? Chair table. Chair table, okay. How much thought did you put into that? Nothing. You just noticed it, right? Okay, that's what noticing your thoughts are. Oh, look at that thought. Oh, look at that thought. That's fantastic. It's like a cloud. Here it comes, there it goes. Here it comes. There. But if you got to the table and you went, I remember the last time this table was in front of the room and she was there with me. <laughs> now, my brain's releasing neurotransmitters and now I've got emotions going on. And by the way, if it gets stuck, I watch that, look at that, it's creating a sadness, that's just amazing. And then it burns off and moves on. Anyway, that's the first step toward mindfulness. Okay, um, I'm gonna just end the way I end every seminar when I speak. Is that okay, you guys? It takes five minutes, got five more minutes? Okay, this is before I learned about movies of the mind. Let me just tell you what happened. I used to do memory seminars all over the United States, teaching college students how to memorize six-figure income, six months a year, Killing it. And my best friend who was working with me, my best friend that I'd known for years in college, he broke into my home, he took some things, and it destroyed my business. Have you ever been betrayed by a really close friend? That hurts, doesn't it? I had him dead to rights. I had evidence he had broken into my home, and I was going to get him. I was going to. But I had a problem. Ruminating is playing something in your head over and over again that's negative. I could not sleep. I was so angry. I have a policy. If you don't know the answer, be the student, find your answer, make it happen. Okay, sometimes you have the answer for yourself, but I went to my older, wiser mentor and I said, hey, 
I don't get it. He did this to me. Why am I so upset? And he says, well, Bob, if you press charges and get him embarrassed and throw him in jail, is that going to save your business? And I go, no, the damage has already been done. He said, well, if it doesn't make a difference, why are you pressing charges? And then I got ticked. Someone's got to teach him a lesson. So, I, man, I was mad. He goes, Bob, that's revenge. And revenge is taking poison and hoping the other person dies. He goes, Bob, you don't have to listen to me, but my advice to you is let it go. He goes, you've got great things in your future. This was 30 years ago. You can't see it yet, but I can. But you've got to let the past go to move forward. Bob, you need to let it go. Now, have you ever heard something and it resonates right to your heart and you go, that's what I need to do? You guys, I tried as hard as I could for two weeks to let it go and I couldn't do it. And this is what happened. Once again, you can say it's God or your higher self because I speak all over the country. I want just everybody to understand we do get inspiration. And I went, I can't let this go. If you want me to let this go, I need help. I can't do it. And I paused. And you know what popped into my head? He used to be your best friend. Do you remember the time you had three months left in college and you ran out of money and you ran out of food? Do you remember when your friend handed you $1,500 cash and said, I'm proud of you that you're going to graduate with a master's. Here's your graduation present in advance. Hey, do you remember the time on Christmas Eve you guys had a, a habit of going into the mall and just enjoying the festivities? But you had a broken foot that year. Remember your friend showed up at your door with a wheelchair he rented just so you could do that? And I watched all the hatred just wash away. So I called him up and I said, hey, I just called the detective in Orem. I've dropped all the charges. I gift you the business and I want to wish you the best of luck. My friend, thinking something was up, says, what is it you really want? I said, you know what I really want? I want my friend back. Now, there are people that told me I was an idiot for doing that. The detective was so mad at me. I'll tell you why I disagree, why I think I did the right thing, because when I hung up the phone, it was like a weight came off of my shoulders. I was able to let it go. And then one year later, he was killed in a car accident. And when I got the news, the first thought that popped into my head is, aren't you glad you let it go? So you guys, for 30 years, whether it's 30,000 people or 10 people, I say, maybe somebody just needed to hear that today. Maybe you're holding a grudge against someone in your family. Maybe a teacher. Maybe something that's happened. Maybe if you're working for someone, someone you work with, someone you work for. Maybe you're mad at the way life's turned out with COVID. Or you're mad at the government or you're mad at God. Or maybe you can't forgive yourself. My advice is like what he told me, let it go. There are good things to come. How many of you think that might be a good idea? Well, the end of my TED talk goes like this. I talk about how my son said, Dad, you never get mad. But something more amazing than that happened. It was when my doctor said, Bob, you are so calm now. I need to know what you know. 60% of my patients are dealing with what you had. And he took me to lunch, showed him Byron Katie and some of the things, and he said it's helped a lot. A medical doctor actually learned something from me. But here's what was really amazing. At the end of my journey, I called my coach, the one who taught me connection. I said, what did you do to me? He goes, what? I said, all the talking in my head stopped. It used to start in the morning and not shut up until night. I had to figure out ways to shut. It just went quiet. What did you do? He goes, I taught you how to get connected to yourself, connected to others, and I told you you would calm down, and it did. So John Wooden, the great basketball coach at UCLA, said this. I'm not what I should be. I'm not what I could be. I'm not what I'm going to be. But I thank God I'm not what I used to be. Be the student. Find your teacher. Make it happen. And if anyone is dealing with what I was dealing with. Remember, I, I didn't believe the doctor when he said it'll get better one day. I'm telling you, or I'm telling your friend that you know, I promise it can get better one day. Thanks, you guys.